no meeting on Friday or Monday, and Monday being the fifth is the last day to. Um, Thank you for the wording. Request uh, committee bills. And so let me begin by asking, are there any bills to be introduced to committee today? Seeing none, we are now going to <laughs> welcome our first present, or our presentation for today. We're always pleased to have her with us, Secretary Laurie Howard, Laura Howard. Be here. Oh, very good. Thank you. Glad to be here. Laura Howard, Secretary for the Department for Children and Families, and I'm delighted to be here to provide an update on um, child welfare and foster care this morning. Um, you should have my handout in front of you. I always like to start just with some context with um, just sort of how things are going a little bit by the numbers. And so if you look at um, page four of the handout, it just gives you a, just a snapshot of the number of youth who are in foster care um, right now. And just as of um, a week or so ago, we had just under 5,900 youth in care. Um, you can see that's a, been a reduction of about 22% since 2019. And that number um, actually shows the lowest need for foster care since January of 2014. Um, and we'll talk some throughout this presentation of the kinds of steps um, that um, administratively we've taken and you've supported as a legislature um, that I think have really supported the reduction in the need for foster care. Um, uh, similarly, um, on the next page, you know, the first, um, you know, the page four was the total number of youth in care. On page five, you'll see children entering foster care across the years, and you really um, see this as well. Um, if you look at the um, number on towards the right, the 2,960 for state fiscal year 23, um, less than 3,000 children entered foster care last fiscal year. And again, that was the lowest number entering foster care in about 18 years. Um, Thus far this year, we're only a little over halfway through the year, um, there's been just under 1,400 youth entering care. So if that trend continues, I think we'll continue to see that decline this year. But again, we're only about halfway through the year this year. Um, and then the, the, the next page, just to um, kind of put a button on that piece, just compares um, children entering and exiting foster care across the years. And you can see that, um, for um, each of the last um, four years, and thus far this fiscal year, um, we've seen more children um, exit foster care than enter foster care. So, so, this, so what I say next may seem a little bit counterintuitive since I've been talking about the reduction of youth in care, the reduction of youth entering care, um, but um, Kansas still has a very high entry rate into foster care compared to other states. And um, if you look at page seven, um, we know that nationally, the rate of entry into foster care is about 2.37 per every thousand children who are in your population as a state. Um, our data from February of 23 shows the Kansas rate of entry into foster care at 4.36. It may have dropped a bit since then, um, but again, nationally, we still have a high number of youth going into care. Um, and. You know, there, there, there's a lot of reasons for that, um, some of which have to do with different statutory schemes in terms of you know, how, um, how children in need of care is defined in different states, whether or not instances where there's not abuse um, is a reason for children to come into care, some things like that. So, so again, uh, just really a context piece that I think even makes it more important, some of the work that we're doing as a state on prevention and on what I'll talk about in terms of uh, uh, some of our partnership with the judiciary as well. Um, on page eight, um, it kind of digs into what I was just talking about a little bit. When we look at the reason that um, children enter foster care, you can see the data from state fiscal year 17 um, through um, this state fiscal year through November 30th. Um, the blue box um, is abuse or neglect. Um, the yellow at the, at the top of each bar, gold, 
is what we call in our statutory scheme a family in need of assessment. Um, that's non-abuse neglect. Um, there can be let me give a couple of examples of that might be. It could be examples of child behavior, could be examples of truancy, um, issues related to substance use, uh, caregivers unable to cope. And sometimes those can mix together. There can be more than one reason cited. But we do know that for those um, what we call FEMA cases, um, about 29% relate to um, child behavior, about 16% truancy, and 30% um, kind of caregiver unable to cope. Um, so again, in some cases, that might suggest actually a service need related to that youth. If you think about a youth, for example, an adolescent with maybe some serious psychiatric issues, things like that, and a, and a parent who's unable to cope. So again, there's kind of a context piece for those cases that are not abuse or neglect. Um, and then one more piece of data also related to children entering care is, is the way in which um, they enter care. Um, on page nine, now remember only law enforcement or the court can actually remove a child, but in terms of who requests that removal, that can come through SRS or it can come um, you know, through, um, through the courts, through police protective custody. So you can see we're um, you know, almost half and half in terms of where those requests come on page nine. Um, for example, this fiscal year thus far, 53% through um, SRS, 47% through that police protective custody route. And I say that, I mean, one of the reasons why I think that's important when I talk about kind of the rate of entry, one of the things that's been very successful in Kansas um, that I really always have to pause and thank the legislature for was your strong support for the Fed Federal Families First Act, which allowed us for the first time four years ago to start um, utilizing federal foster care funds um, for preventative services. Um, when a child um, comes in through police protective custody and through the court, we may not have that opportunity at the front end to assess that family for whether or not they might be a good candidate for those services that would allow that family to stay at home. So again, um, again, just kind of a context piece in terms of some of the work we're really trying to do with our partners. And you'll hear more about this later in the presentation. Um, um, last, just data piece, um, finalized adoptions, um, about 880 adoptions uh, last fiscal year. Um, again, as the data continues, it's, it's about 51% adoptions were with relatives, about 46% were with foster parents. Um, and the average age of a child in our system at the time of the finalized adoption is eight years old. Almost 60% are eight or under. And we're really um, pleased with the fact that over half of the children were adopted as part of a sibling group. So really keeping those siblings together. What I would point out though is the average length of time in care for that, those adoptions is 41 months. I mean, I think that's too long. I mean, I think that's work we need to continue to work on as an agency and with our judicial partners and our case management partners to reduce that length of time in care um, towards permanency in general. Um, you know, we kids stay in care too long in Kansas, both from the standpoint of adoption and reunification. So, so those are um, some efforts and I think some important work with our judicial partners. Um, I next wanted to, to talk about some of the prevention and community engagement um, items that I was alluding to um, when I was talking about the, the foster care numbers and some of that contribution. You know, on page 12, you know, I mentioned family first. Um, you know, since um, Kansas implemented family first as one of the first states in the nation to jump on this opportunity, um, we have made 5,000, just under 5,100 referrals to Family First. Um, and as you'll recall, you know, this is a, was a federally authorized um, program that would allow states to spend um, matching federal dollars for evidence-based services to support mental health services, parent skill building, substance use services or some supports to families in the legal realm, um, what we call kinship navigation. Um, and 
And it's important to know that the families that get referred to this service have to be at imminent risk of removal into foster care. So this is not primary prevention way upstream. These are families that, in the absence of family first, likely would have come into foster care. So of those 5,000 referrals that have happened over the last four years, you can see on page 13 that 90% of those target youth who've reached 12 months from the time we made that referral have remained safely at home without the need for foster care. So again, been a very successful, a very successful program. Um, our, our partners and contractors have done a great job. Um, and, uh, and, and a few other, uh, and we have, a, we have great evaluation of this. I think one of the things that's so important about Family First is not only does it use evidence-based programs, but the federal government required, you know, kind of robust evaluation. And we have an evaluation on contract with the University of Kansas. And I've given you aggregate data, but they can go into every single service and every single provider and provide us detail on the success of that program. So again, I really, really appreciate the, the research behind it and, 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 and those pieces. I might just remind, um, this committee that, that a year ago uh, funding was increased um, for Family First and last spring we um, rebid those, those contracts for Family First um, and a, a couple of things just important to point out. Um, for the first, in the first few years, we had very few substance use disorder services. And when you think about everything going on with regard to substance use, we really weren't satisfied with that. I think we still don't have enough, but we do have in our new contracts a substance use service in each of our regions. Um, I, we have um, what's called the START program through DECA, um, sobriety treatment and recovery teams, um, which has a supported rating on the, the federal clearinghouse that ranks programs, as well as our KVC strengthening programs. The other um, big piece that happened with the new contracts, we were able to extend multi-systemic therapy statewide. That's a really, really valuable program, um, particularly with adolescents, particularly with um, youth who may have acting out um, um, behaviors. Um, it's, it's also been a program that's been very effective in the juvenile offender world. So again, very excited about that. Um, consistent outcomes, um, you know, for three years, very low percentage of children removed. So again, very much a contributor to what we see in terms of the reduced demand for foster care. Um, I also wanted to um, make this committee aware of some grants that we made that go a little bit further upstream, um, a little bit more community-based. We're not necessarily talking about youth at imminent risk of coming into the system, but we awarded uh, grants last year to 10 entities to develop what are called family resource centers. Um, these are community-based or school-based hubs, you know, typically trusted community organizations um, that provide services to families um, to reduce the likelihood of child abuse or neglect. Um, they can be very um, specific in terms of as narrow as a specific zip code, or they could cover a number of counties, and I'll, and I'll show you a map on the next page. Um, they also can have a variety of focuses. Um, they might be, for example, focused on early childhood and childcare. They might be focused on parenting, might be focused on helping parents with life skills or, or employment training skills. But what we know nationally from, um, fam from family resource center outcomes is you see a significantly lower rate of child abuse investigations, a 65% reduced rate of substantiated child abuse cases, a 73% reduction in the number of kids in foster care, and really improvement in educational success and, and family self-sufficiency. Um, we also have a grant with the Kansas Children's Service League um, to work with our family resource centers to gain national certification. Um, and we also entered into an evaluation because I want to be able to come back with you and give you the kind of data I've given you on Family First on our family resource centers as those move forward. But you can see on page 16 um, a map of those entities. Um, 
where, where you see um, kind of a star or counties where services would be provided. Um, but you see, um, you know, a couple school districts, um, Turner School District in Wyandotte, um, see um, Lyons School District in Emporia. Um, the Urban League in Wichita is, is like one zip code, but then Live Well Northwest, which is a preventative early childhood agency in the Northwest, they're in like 12 counties. So again, um, pretty good um, statewide access um, as, as we enter into um, kind of this efforts with family resource centers. And we're really excited about that, excited about the interest um, that there was and excited to be able to collect data and be able to report back to you on that. Um, the other thing on kind of the prevention front end side I wanted to talk to talk with this committee about, and those of you on the Child Welfare Oversight Committee have heard this before, um, but one of the things that um, we've spent a lot of energy on as an agency over the last couple years is what we would call the, the Four Questions Program. And this comes out of an effort that happened in the state of Iowa where seven judges um, began asking four questions as a pilot project before making a decision to remove a child into custody. Um, they asked, what can we do to remove the danger instead of the child? Can someone the child or family knows move into the home to remove the danger? Can a caregiver and the child go live with a relative? Or could the child move temporarily? And in this pilot project, um, they found during that pilot project period, just in those jurisdictions, a 50% reduction of children coming into care and an increase in the initial placement with family members and relatives. Um, you know, later on, that turned into legislative changes where they actually changed their child in need of care code, um, requiring specific findings that the harm, um, that you had to consider the harm that happens for a child coming into care and that, um, <clears throat> and that the child's safety substantial, that the child needed to come into care um, for their safety, and that the harm of coming into care didn't outweigh that. So, so, so that was kind of the Iowa project. We've done a number of things with that, where we've um, incorporated that ourselves um, within the questions that our staff ask when we do what we call team decision-making um, early in a case where folks come around the table and look at the safety. And we recently got um, some funding from KU School of Social Welfare. They've had a federal grant for a number of years that has to do with supporting relatives and families, and they recently gave us some funding to support some of the community conversations in our regions, about $48,000 um, related to kind of the four questions projects. And I just wanted to just give you a couple of examples. These are some things that are new in terms of what some of this impact has been. Um, it goes a little bit back to my, my conversations about our work with uh, courts and county attorneys. But for example, on page 19 um, in our West region, um, you know, we've done, we've done some work um, with the four questions, um, first with the courts. We now have courts asking and county attorneys asking if the four questions were considered um, before a child came into care. We have courts using our language. Um, and then also what I talked to earlier about not sometimes having that opportunity to think about whether a prevention service is appropriate, um, allow, the courts allowing DCF time from the point a child comes into police protective custody to set up a team decision, me, um, decision making meeting to see whether or not child safety um, can be sustained and if the family would be a good candidate for, for a prevention or another alternative. So, I mean, that's really huge in terms of having that opportunity when we might not have had that in the past where the child would have just immediately come into foster care. Um, so uh, again, um, just one example in Salina, I think 89% of home recommendations included no court involvement. In Northeast Kansas, in, in Shawnee County, um, we're also, we've also been able to begin staffing those police protective custody cases and having um, monthly meetings with court services. Um, so again, just an, another example about that. Um, a, a slightly different in the Southeast region, um, we have some really, really active work in the Southeast region, um, a project called Agencies Working Together, where DCF and partner agencies in the community are 
really making sure that everyone knows what the various community resources are. There's kind of a virtual chat to support families. Maybe they have a concrete need. You know, who could meet that need? What might that opportunity be? So again, other ways to continue to work with community-based resources as well as state resources to see whether we can safely support families. And again, if a child needs to come into care for their safety, you know, that needs to happen. Um, but, but again, if, there, if the family can be supported um, and if it's not an issue of abuse, then um, we think it's important to explore those other alternatives. Um, the, the next section is some updates specific to um, some activities within foster care. Um, the first two things I'll talk about, um, and I'll just couch it. Um, right at the top that I can't say very much because we have active RFPs, um, but I should be able to say more very soon. Um, our foster care case management RFPs, these are our primary foster care contractors um, who manage, who do our case management for us. And we are in the very final stages of reviewing proposals. Um, I expect that we will have announcements by February, so we'd be happy to uh, brief the committee or pro uh, we'll definitely obviously provide legislators an update um, at the point that we're ready to make those announcements. I would let you know that um, we had um, five bidders. Um, four were existing bidders, existing case management providers, um, so KBC. Uh, St. Francis Ministries, TFI Family Services, and Cornerstones of Care, and we had one new bidder, Ember Hope. So again, I should have more to say about that within the next week or two. We should have some final decisions there. Um, one of the important pieces, I think, in those new case management contracts and something that I know has been talked about quite a bit in the Child Welfare Oversight Committee has to do with the caseloads. And I, th I think I, so I reported this to the Child Welfare Oversight Committee, but we've required um, the, the national requirements related to, to caseloads to make sure that those caseloads of our contractors aren't too high and they're able to provide the appropriate support to families. Um, the second um, RFP on page 23 um, that's also in process is the Comprehensive Child Welfare Information System. Um, this has um, been a long time coming, and I would thank the legislature again for your support for planning dollars, um, kind of in the first couple years of this administration. Um, and then the governor's budget this year um, provides new funding of about $17 million from all funding sources, half of that state funds, half of that's federal dollars, um, that would be over a four year period for the new information system. Um, you know, this will replace five existing legacy systems and will also link information from our, our contracting agencies. Long time coming. Um, the, um, the primary um, RFP with this, there's a lot of RFPs with IT projects. You have, you need a, you have to have, you know, various kinds of an evaluation contract, um, a validation contract. But the primary one, the, the RFP for design, development, and implementation, um, is under active review. We had 11 bidders for this. Um, we've narrowed that down and we're currently doing program demonstrations. Um, and I expect by late March, we'll be able to come back to you and let you know who that, who that bidder is. Um, so again, we had a, we, there was a lot of interest in this um, and we had a, a 11 bidders. So happy to give you more information when I can on that, but this will be really, really important in the system and it's a long time coming, um, so. Another update I wanted to give um, with regard to our foster care program is another collaboration with the judicial branch. And you might recall um, when the Chief Justice gave her state of the judiciary, she um, referenced this. Um, these are family treatment courts. Um, the the courts are looking at, and I think at the, um, and I think the Chief Justice credited Senator Baumgartner with the idea of creating family treatment courts, um, where there would be family-centered court dockets for cases of child maltreatment in which parental substance use is a contributing factor. So both my DCF and KDADS team have been on planning in, on a planning group with the judicial branch, um, and this will kick off in September of 24. Um, in three counties, Cowley, Lyon, and Miami counties. 
Um, and the governor actually has included some funding in the KDADS budget for the treatment costs related to that. So, you know, KDADS manages those substance use costs for a lot of different things, even like for some of the corrections programs. So that funding was actually put into the KDADS budget uh, to support the family treatment courts. I'm really excited about that. I'm excited about being able to measure those outcomes, what that means in terms of time and care, um, parental engagement and the like. Um, and the, the other piece we're very, very excited about with regard to the judiciary is the Child Welfare Summit coming up. Felt like a long time ago when we used to talk about it. Now it's just a couple months, April 15th to 16th. I hope uh, many of you will be a part of that. Um, the, um, with the judicial branch, the legislature, um, and the executive branch. Um, one of the exciting things about uh, how this will function, and, and some of you may have been part of the Mental Health Summit a couple years ago, um, is that there'll be teams that are kind of geographically based. So um, really getting those players together. Um, you can see examples of those teams on, on page 25. Um, but then the work won't stop after the two days. Folks can go back to their jurisdictions. They can continue to do work. And some of the topics, um, you know, collaboration, um, disproportionality in the child welfare system. Um, I talked about permanency already, you know, kind of the length of time in care. Um, um, and some uh, and some overlap issues with mental health. So again, very excited about that upcoming summit. Um, I also wanted to give you an update um, in terms of legislative updates from some funding and statutory changes that happened last year. Um, the first is in the realm of therapeutic foster homes. Um, you know, as, as we, um, as a state, um, focus on the needs of some of those highest need youth, um, who are those youth who tend to move around in care, who might be that youth who lands in an office due to a lack of placement? One of the things that we um, originally introduced in July of 2022 was a new category of care called therapeutic family foster homes. So, you know, we established a rate, we established some definitions for what that might look like. Um, you know, and these are really um, specialty homes, you know, limited to mo no more than two kiddos, um, really required to complete additional targeted training um, to allow them to be able to support youth with intensive needs. Um, that could be step-down care from residential services or from an acute bed. Um, it also could be um, a preventative approach for youth at risk of DCF custody or PRTF treatment. But we were really pleased that in the last legislative session, um, I've got a pie chart on page 28, um, you supported $6 million in our budget to allow us to really um, invest more in this. You know, it's kind of one thing to create a category of care and to have our child placement agencies try to develop that. It's another thing to get targeted resources to really grow that. So we've had an RFP out for capacity building grants in therapeutic foster care. I'm getting some neat ideas from, from partners um, about um, work they might do in different parts of the state. Um, and then also, in that, and, and, and those should be announced as well in the next couple weeks. And then um, also doing some work around the training side, some statewide centralized recruitment, and a little bit on the prevention side in terms of what that might look like um, on the therapeutic side to have an option um, for families um, before their child would come into care. A second update also related to um, some of the activity last year and, and for a number of years, um, juvenile crisis intervention centers. You initially passed this legislation several years ago. Um, we worked on this for a while. We had an RFP from an entity and we're never quite able to make it come together. Um, last year, um, you made some adjustments in the legislation to um, expand the breadth of what JCIC would cover um, related to a behavioral health crisis. Um, we 
have the licensing regulations completed, we will actually be talking to the Rules and Regulations Committee this Friday about the JCIC regulations, and we have entered into a memorandum of agreement with, with the Department of Corrections um, for $2 million from the Evidence-Based Programs Fund, which had all, always been anticipated for this program. So once those regs are final, um, we'll be able to enter into provider agreements with willing providers um, and, all, and set up a daily rate of payment for any youth who are in our custody. And then the $2 million will really help providers with startup costs, um, infrastructure costs, or, or costs outs for youth who may not be um, in custody. So again, right now we've had interest from Johnson and Sedgwick counties, um, and so we look forward to being able to report on actual agreements agreements with them in the coming months. So again, a long time coming. Glad to have the rules and regs where they are. Uh, on page 30, last year, um, you also, within the budget, approved a million dollars um, related to um, children with intellectual developmental disabilities um, to, in terms of foster care prevention. Um, we had stakeholder meetings with providers and community agencies, and we've entered into a grant with families together to provide um, family support, parenting workshops, resource connections. Um, so these services are accessible statewide. Um, they can be um, in the home um, if that's what the family's needs are. So again, we'll be measuring that effectiveness and um, I think it's really important to have families to have someone to outreach to when they may be, may be struggling with, with those resources. So again, excited about that. Um, another update from last legislative session um, was also funding was put into our budget to support um, expansion of functional family therapy um, and we entered into grants with the three agencies who already do that um, for juvenile services and KDOC, Ember Hope, Cornerstones of Care, and Eckerd Connects. Um, again, um, very, very valuable evidence-based service, um, has great outcomes. It really targets um, you know, those adolescent youth, um, high acuity, complex needs, um, and it can be used um, in custody and reintegration home, can really be accelerated by the use of FFT. Um, and if we have youth who have maybe um, gone home, but there continue to be some issues um, or challenges that might put them at risk of re-entering foster care, this is a service we can provide to those families uh, post-reunification as well. So again, very excited to getting that um, built up and staffed up by, by those organizations. So a lot of activity just coming out of the last, um, the last legislative session that's, I, I think, really valuable. Uh, the, the last one I would mention in that regard comes out of House Bill 2021. Had a lot of elements, um, but related to DCF, um, this, um, the bill would allow certain youth in, um, in DCF custody to access some of the evidence-based services that are available for juvenile offenders um, through the JCABs in the community. Um, we um, worked with our partners and with DOC Juvenile Services to develop an, um, the, the tool we would use um, and how we would use that to identify those youth that, um, that, would, be, that would qualify for these services. And again, they, they need to have, you can kind of see that third bullet, um, you know, exhibiting behavior that could lead to juvenile offender charges related to physical violence, aggression, damage to property, or use of life that threatening drugs, and they have to meet certain scoring on some certain subscales. So again, excited about that opportunity uh, for our for our case management partners to work directly in the community to access those resources. Um, this legislative session, we've got one bill remaining from last session that has to do with foster youth bank accounts that had passed the House and is currently in the Senate Financial Institutions Committee. Um, you'll also see um, a, a couple, some new proposals from us. One has to do with codifying the, our authority to provide mental health screenings and treatment for pre-adjudicated youth. It's probably more of a technical or clarifying change. The statute lets me authorize medical care, but not necessarily mental health care um, on a pre-adjudication basis if the parent isn't available. Um, removing the mandatory requirement for foster care child support collections. Um, 
um, a transparency bill um, allowing us to release certain information to the public related to child fatality cases when criminal charges have been filed, and then what we're calling a public assistance accessibility package. And I think, I think most two of two of those have, three of those have been um, introduced, and the last one should be introduced um, this week. Um, the last thing I would call out, um, I, I don't know if this will come to, to this committee or not, but we're very excited about the SOUL program, and I think those of you um, on the Child Welfare Oversight Committee are familiar with this. Um, this is an effort that um, Kansas um, was offered the opportunity by the, um, the Casey Foundation was doing some work nationally with youth. Um, youth kind of came together who had lived experience in foster care and said, you know, some of just kind of what's there just doesn't really work for us. I know as, as particularly those youth who would, who would likely aid statute that wouldn't require them to um, sever ties with their biological parents. Um, and so can, we kind of jumped on to this opportunity um, and have gone through a couple year process alongside OJA advocates, our, our providers and partners. Um, and a, the, the statutory language to bring this forward has been um, introduced in House Bill 2536. And the first hearing was held in um, Rep. Simkin Cannon's committee um, last week. Um, and it was really, really heartening to see those young people come and tell their stories and what would, what would make a difference for them in terms of having those um, permanent relationships as they would age out of, of, of the child welfare system without severing their biological family ties. And we know how important engagement is and permanent relationships are. So again, more about that. I mean, they, they're far more eloquent and they're speaking about this than I can ever be. And I, I hope that you get the, the chance to hear and interact with them during this process. So with that, Madam Chair, I'll stand for any questions the committee might have. Thank you so much, Secretary Howard. Committee questions. Senator Holscher. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I do have a couple of questions. Um, can you tell me what factors, I know that you said that you're looking at the RFPs and hoping to have a d decisions made in the springtime. Can you tell me when you're reviewing those RFPs, what factors are considered as far as um, how those contracts are awarded? Sure. I mean, just generally, you know, in reviewing an RFP, you know, there are you know, there are the various criteria that we placed into the RFP, whether it's the CWIS or the Child Welfare Case Management Providers or any other RFP. So there's a process of reviewing, um, you know, what each entity, how they responded to each of those, um, how well they did um, in terms of what they um, expressed they would do um, in terms of responding to each of those pieces. Did they meet every um, technical requirement? And, and what was their proposal um, for things that we asked them to describe? what their you know what their service model would look like things like that so yeah. may, I, may I ask you mm -hmm. is litigation taken into consideration if there are cases brought forward against um, some of the organizations um, I think not and I guess yeah. the cost to the state too yeah I mean I mean not directly not directly um, you know one of the things that um, are contracts require is that um, vendors have, you know, appropriate kinds of liability insurance. So, yeah. Senator, did you, did you have a question, Senator Baumgartner? Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here today, Secretary. Um, just like the chair, I also serve on the oversight committee, and we have repeatedly heard from Cornerstones of Care in fact, they mentioned it again at the last meeting that they had not had any kids sleeping in offices for all of last year. And yet, um, between January and June of last year, they had 17 kids spend 26 nights in a shelter that is actually in Missouri, the Osnaman, O-Z-A-N-A-M, Osnam campus. Mm -hmm. So are they the only um, contractor that's taking kids across state? And why is it that that is occurring? Have they stopped that practice? 
I, I would have to check, Senator, in terms of the numbers that um, they have in, in that situation today. I mean, that really was their service model, and they would be the first to say that it wasn't an ideal service model to avoid youth in offices, but it was an option um, to say, let's have a let's have a safe environment, let's do kind of the context of an emergency shelter. So I'd be happy to check, though, in terms of what those numbers are today. Um, you know, everything always, you know, it's a... You know, the, the decisions of, you know, how can we keep youth out of offices? You know, you know, we did kind of the failure to place network where we had some sort of reserve foster care beds or group home beds. Um, you know, that was one successful option. I, I think folks have just tried different options with different youth, but I'd be, I'd be happy to check on what those numbers are today. Well, I think yeah. the bigger point is mm -hmm. as a contractor, they have never indicated that they're taking kids out of state. And so did the court, do the courts approve to take kids out of state? Because I know that I have repeatedly heard from grandparents that live out of state mm -hmm. that they were unable to have custody mm -hmm. of their grandchildren mm -hmm. who were put in foster homes because they lived out of state, even though it was just across the state line. So how is it? And I, I think there is a question as to, is it truly safer to be put in a group home if it's very temporary so you were aware of it yeah I was aware that they that they were using a emergency shelter services for their youth that's right I mean we have had specific agreements that go across the state lines with Missouri in the metro area um, and so I mean I don't think any of this was a surprise to the courts or anything like that I don't think this wasn't a this wasn't intended to be something that was hidden or anything in terms of where the child was placed I think you can appreciate how disingenuous mm -hmm. it is to say that we have not had any kids spending the night in an office but what we've done is we've taken them across a state line because that's never been shared with the oversight committee or any committee that I know of and I would apologize for that, Senator. Um, certainly no, no intent, I don't think, by anyone to, um, to kind of keep that a secret. I mean, I think Cornerstones in their conversations is, I, I'm not sure, but with the Oversight Committee, they've often talked about how, you know, it's not necessarily the best model, but it was a model that as they were, as they were a newer contractor trying to develop more of their own placement resources, it was a, an option that worked for them, so. They made quite a point, and they mm -hmm. have made quite a point mm -hmm. of not having a child spend a night in an mm -hmm. office. They have. Um, and in fact, they were reckon, you know, given accolades mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. And it is an issue of not so much commission, but omission, not sharing that information. Could you share with us? I know that we um, lost two foster kids um, just this month. Two foster kids have died. How many in the last year have we had that have died? I'll have to bring that information back to you. I don't have that with me today, Senator. We can get that back to the committee, though. Okay, and one final question, Madam Chair. When will we find out more information about um, the little five-year-old here in Topeka that was murdered living in a tent home and that, that trail of contacted, not contacted, touched, not touched, as far as with law enforcement or with DCF? I, I think, as you know, Senator, as a part of the Oversight Committee, I was able to, to brief the Oversight Committee in executive session about the contacts um, that DCF had had with that family. Um, I mean, anything beyond that um, would, would trigger kind of a, a next... Um, next levels under the statutes where in order for anything further to be released um, in detail, you know, the, we would need to have, there would be an open records request of us. Um, the courts would have to um, go through a process as to whether or not to release that. Um, and that's not transpired at this point. I mean, traditionally, they've chosen not to release the full records. And so what we, what we were able to brief the oversight committee on and what we could do in executive session you know, with another eligible committee like this committee, we could certainly do that. But in terms of what we might release more publicly, um, that really would not happen without court release of that. So. I guess I'm thinking more in terms of, based on that, what occurred, mm 
-hmm. how communication has changed, improved, what the process, any new process whereby DCF is working more in concert with law enforcement, um, with organizations oh, such as a city turning off water in a home knowing a minor lives there. Um, same thing with Evergy and so forth. Sure. I can tell you, Senator, that we, we did make some policy changes um, related to um, that situation. Um, you know, as, as this committee may recall, under Adrian's law, which was a law that passed after a tragic child death a number of years ago, there were requirements that DCF make face-to-face um, -face contact, um, right? Um, you know, and, and I, I can't, I can't say a lot of details here publicly, but I think those on the oversight committee know what, what I shared with that with the oversight committee. What we have done in policy now is require um, tighter timeframes in which if one of our workers um, is not able to locate the family when they would contact law enforcement. Um, I mean, there's a series. There's a series of pieces when they would consult with the supervisor. Um, reminders of making those contacts out of normal working hours, and we'd be happy to share that new policy with you. That was a specific policy that that changed with regard to um, after the death of Zoe Felix, and also the bill I referenced earlier, kind of the transparency bill that I've that we're requesting in this session um, is also a bill, um, kind of going back to your first question, um, the, the, the bill we're introducing would say if there is a child death um, and char you know, current, under current law, and unless we make a finding of abuse or neglect contributing to the death, we can't release anything. Well, typically in a situation where law enforcement is involved, it could be months before we would ever make that. So what this legislation would do is say, if someone is charged in that death, then I could then release that information. I think it's in the, I think it's in the public good to be able to have that transparency, to be able to share at least minimum information about whether the agency had contact, Did have contact, how much contact, um, you know, whatever that looks like to be able to do that. I think otherwise, you know, there ends up being speculation. Sometimes it's true, sometimes it's not. I'd rather just have it out there, whatever that information is. So that's the legislation that um, we just introduced um, yesterday um, on the House side. So thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Secretary. Senator Erickson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Two quick questions, if I might. On page 10, we're talking about adoptions. You said the average time in care was 41 months. Do you know how much of that time is actually just waiting for the adoption process to be completed? I don't know today, Senator. I, I could certainly check and see what we know about that. Um, that is an area where we've tried to do some things over time. You know, at some points we, we've had what we called adoption accelerators where we just kind of had some extra staff who were kind of focused on the paperwork and those kinds of things to kind of help the courts. But I, I don't know today how much of that time is that. Thank you. And Madam Chair, just yeah. one other quick question, if I might. You presented an awful lot of programs and grants and opportunities for providers. And how do you communicate for potential providers that these opportunities to work in these programs to provide services, how do you communicate that so that they know that they're the opportunities to, to participate? Sure, that's a great question, Senator. Um, you know, and it, it depends on what kind of opportunity it is. Um, so most of the things that we, we talked about today you know, happen through like formal bid processes, either through the Department of Administration or through us, uh, or, or through DCF. And so we have a, um, a very large um, list of partners. Um, and so whenever there's a bid opportunity like that, um, that goes out not just to like our case management providers, but to kind of the larger realm of, of human service partners. So, um, so, so it would obviously be just through the bid process, but then we, we um, then say who should that actually be directly sent to so they're aware of it. So we, we try to make that very well known to partners. If someone wanted to get on that list, how would they get on that list? Um, they can um, partners. Yeah, um, I mean, just ask them to contact me or Deputy Secretary Keyes, and we can get them on that list. Um, yeah. Senator Blasey. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you, Secretary Howard, for being here. I just want a few questions, but before I do that, I just want to say thank you for all your agency's work on adoptions. 
You guys have, you guys, your, your department's vital to, to adoptions being finalized in the state of Kansas, and you've always been extremely responsive and helpful to um, so many adoptive families in the state, so I just want to say thank you. There's no greater joy for many families than Adoption Day, and so I uh, appreciate all your efforts and desires to try to speed up the process. Uh, my question is, I actually have a great, I have a constituent in my district who's a, finalizing a child um, adoption from foster care this week. And so we're very proud for them and excited and and I um, uh, hope we can see more people do that. And so I'm curious if you have any thoughts, one, to encourage foster care adoptions, because ultimately I think the biggest hurdle for a lot of people is time. It's such a painful process and in, in terms of time and not really knowing truly if you're gonna be able to adopt that child or if they're gonna be reunited with their family, which is obviously our ultimate goal is reunification. But we know in many instances, that's just not possible. So I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that. Now, that's a great question, Senator. And, and, and obviously, that's, a, that's an important issue for foster parents, um, some of whom you know, really come in, become foster parents, um, never thinking about adoption and really wanting to foster children, others who kind of enter foster care with the thought of adoption in mind. Um, you know, I think some of the, the focused work we're doing with courts might help, but, but also one of the things we've been um, talking about, frankly, just in the last couple of days, I don't know that I've talked about this, and I haven't talked about this in front of a legislative committee. Um, one of the things when we've been looking at our length of time for adoption or our length of time for reunification um, is... Um, <clears throat> I asked one of our attorneys to kind of look at how other states are approaching that process, um, who might um, have those things happen more timely. Um, and, you know, in the federal law, um, there's like a 12-month period to um, have that first permanency hearing, and then you have to have the remaining like at least every 12 months. A number of states have changed their statutes, and they've accelerated that. So maybe they're requiring the first hearing in nine months, and then they're requiring subsequent hearings in six months. Some have bifurcated that for younger children, um, which, you know, and I have a lot of interest in that possibility in the sense of when you think particularly of younger kids, what, what proportion of their life is spent in foster care before they get to permanency. So some states have even more aggressive timelines um, because, because what that really does, Senator, is to get to that decision point that you're talking about is, is reunification going to happen or does adoption become the case plan? So we've just begun looking at that honestly within the last couple of weeks to say what might other states have done just related to timelines. Um, and I think those are things that obviously are statutory possibilities. I think they're also things that we can work with specific courts on as well. So um, again, I, uh, I had not been aware that a number of states had, had changed those. I knew about special courts. You know, there's a, there's a whole national kind of baby court movement that's been in place for a number of years that has very specialized, short, intensive timelines um, to really to try to get to permanency and child time. So I, I might just offer that, Senator, as one option. That's, that's great to know. I'll have to do some research into that. I know one of the greatest uh, reasons, one of the big reasons why adoptions take a while is just because the process of severing a parental's rights. Obviously, it's a very big decision um, for the court to do that. And so I'm curious if, if you know by chance if in the 41 months you have listed as the average length of time, is that, is that from the day that child enters foster care to the day of finalization or either a dominance or permanency, I guess is the word you used, um, or is that, or how much of that is trying to sever a parent's parental rights? I'm going to ask my deputy secretary if she can speak to that. She, I saw her getting a little bit um, jittery antsy here. So um, come on up. Good morning, Tanya Keys with the Department for Children and Families. The, the number of 41 months is the time from they entered care to the time that they exited foster care. So it would be uh, the adoption finalization in this circumstance with the 41 months. Okay, thank you. And then my last question is um, regarding regarding homelessness. So I was told the statistics, so we're trying to, as we all know, we're trying to find solutions to the homeless crisis facing Kansas and really across the whole nation. But I was told a statistic that 30% of people homeless, particularly in Wichita, now I don't know if this is accurate, you can tell me if I'm wrong or if it's wrong, but it said 30% of homeless people in, in Wichita have aged out of foster care. So I'm curious if that's, if that's remotely true, and, and two, what steps are we doing or can we do to ensure kids who are aging out of foster care don't just go to the streets? Because ultimately that is a very um, 
horrific thing to do in a, in a first world country. I mean, I hope that's something that's not something we can do to help address that. Yeah, thank you, Senator. You know, I have no knowledge of that statistic. That does make, I mean, we'll do some outreach to Wichita about, I don't know if they've done a point in time count recently. They just did this last yeah. week, I think. Yeah, so I, I mean, we, I'm, we'll reach out just to see about that. That would, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that's true or not true. That would surprise me. In terms of youth um, aging out of foster care, I mean, there are a lot of resources and supports. Um, and this legislature has a allowed funding to increase the subsidy that we provide to those youth. Um, we've also done some partnerships with housing agencies. There's been some new federal options coming in that relate specifically to housing. And we have some specific jurisdictions in Kansas doing that. But... Um, and, and, and then, of course, the child can also give a medical card. There's educational pieces. I think the piece that's always, that I feel like is always kind of on us and on our partners, it really has to do with engagement in the sense of, you know, honestly, there are some youth that they want to be done. And, and, and how do we best um, support them in understanding that um, these resources that are available to them aren't about, you know, trying to control them or keep them in a system or anything like that. This is about giving them the opportunity to be successful as they leave the system. But again, we do have fairly robust supports. Um, I think our, I think the issue is um, engagement, the number of youth who, who engage with that, so. Thank you, Secretary. Um, I have reduced my five questions to one because we're out of time, but I noticed on your legislative slide 33 um, that you mentioned removing mandatory requirement for child support. Would you explain why that's part of your legislative agenda? Sure. Um, you know, today, um, when a child comes into custody, um, ch child support orders are um, entered into with regard to that child's family. Um, and, you know, and it varies, you know, courts do different things across the state. Maybe that might be $25 or it might be a larger amount. Um, our federal partners have really encouraged states to move away from that being something mandatory and having states look at it more on a situational basis. You know, when does that make sense? You know, um, and when do when does it not make sense to have a family? I mean, you know, they're struggling to do everything they can do to bring their child back home. Um, they're you know trying to comply with everything that that um, all, all the requirements. You know, whether that's parenting classes or that's making sure they have a stable job. And then to have that child come home and then be hit with a major child support bill. I mean, it just really puts the family back in a precarious position. So this would not mean that there couldn't be ever be child support orders entered. It would just be looking at the specific circumstances to see whether or not that makes sense in those circumstances. Thank you, Madam Secretary. We are out of time. Uh, I would encourage those who are listening on WebEx or in the room today, um, Friday, of course, is our Bob Bethel All Day Committee uh, hearings that you can learn a lot from in addition to our hearing today. I last year chaired that committee, and this year I'll be vice chair of that committee. And I believe the last word is from um, our senator here who would like to, uh, Senator Petty would like to introduce her pages. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have two pages today. As we know in the Senate, this yesterday was the first day we had one page in, in the Senate. Girls, would you stand up? These are uh, young ladies from Turner High School. We have Laren Young, and she's a sophomore, and then Caitlin Gouvion, and she's a freshman, and this is actually, Caitlin was here last year. But they're, they're looking forward to seeing um, what's going on in Turner, and as we heard Turner mention as being a uh, resource center, having a resource center in, in that school district. And also, I'll just give a shout out for Turner. I'm a Turner alum myself. They, they took fourth in the Battle of the Brains in the metropolitan area, over 740 uh, entries, and they got $15,000 for STEM programs in their, at their high school.